All right. Howdy. Another Saturday live stream on the Teledyne's YouTube channel. Uh, we're just going to hang out and talk about some whatever comes up for the day. Um, howdy. Glad to see you back again. That's a little better. Hiya. What's going on? Just had a fun gig last night. Um down at a place called the pub in the tunic um down like the south end tip of rhode island and that's um right by the it's right on the atlantic if you look at a map you can see like block island is a little kind of resort area you know, not resort but it's a mostly a tourist area there's some people live on their island living it's cool um a lot of live music there too yeah, I'm doing pretty good. Um, yeah, the gig was the gig was a lot of fun. Um, the way it works down there, it's cool because the it's a tiny. Well, it's bigger now, but it used to be just this little Irish pub. Um, hi, how you doing? Welcome. Um, and <laughs> they used to be behind the bar. There used to be this um, just this little stage, just enough for one guy to stand kind of behind the bar and you could kind of see their head but it, it would almost stick up in the in the shelf and and um it would just play acoustic and the first time we played there we said oh where are we going to set up and they pointed to that little stage and i'm like <laughs> we have drums and bass and everything i was gonna say we're just joking but um they've expanded it since then and added a nice big area because we used to have to kind of set up in this tiny little corner but um it's right next to this other place called the Ocean Mist, which is a bigger um, music venue. And they have, you know, semi-national acts and stuff come through there. In fact, I got to see um, Dick Dale play at the Ocean Mist, uh, one of his last shows. And um, that, was, that, was, uh, that was cool. Yeah, it was... Um, that was a, that was a pretty cool show. We had that uh, that gold Stratocaster. And he played unusual because he played left-handed, but it was still strung like a right, uh, like a right right-handed guitar. So the E, the low E, was on the bottom, and the high was on the top. And the bass player had this two giant fif two fifteen cab, like almost like an SDC kind of. I think those were, were those 410s? I'm not sure. I think they're maybe 215s. Electric bass, just thunderous. But um, yeah, pretty cool. So um, I want to announce, too, we got um, the channels growing pretty nicely. We got, um, I guess we'll call it the first stage of um, mic volume comes and goes. Okay, it could be. Let me, let me turn it up a little bit. How's that? A little better? Hopefully. It may be some... I have that um, noise cancellation thing that's in here. I can turn that off. Good. Okay, good. Yeah, I didn't have it up enough sorry about that um yeah so the channel's growing and we got um the first stage of whatever monetization i guess you could call it and that's uh so we have the um have the men membership things i don't know if you saw it pop up i know when i went on another computer today it, it ac um, asks for the if you want to join or whatever and it's uh you know just the first step to becoming the the youtube partner until the channel gets enough out watch hours to get to where the, if you see any ads for the the videos that pop up, then it'll start generating you know income for the 
for the channel, which is great. And then more of that, that happens more than I can, ha you know, produce more content and get it going a little bit more. And as I've said in the past, oh, thank you. I appreciate it. Um, it's thanks to you guys for, you know, joining in on the live streams. That's helped the watch hours go up incredibly, uh, much faster than just normally producing content. Um, and plus it's fun to just hang out and chat about whatever. Um, play some guitar for you guys and, uh, chat about some good, good music. What was the, uh, the other thing I was going to say? The, uh, yeah, the, uh, the things we have now are just the base the membership just has some, you know, there's, isn't really a lot of exclusive content or anything yet, but I'm starting to add some things that are going to be there. And then they asked if we wanted to do these little emoji things. It's kind of silly, but <laughs> yeah, we definitely need some beers. What's your beer of choice? Do you like IPAs or more like a lager kind of thing? I like both. <laughs> or Guinness is good. Too. I it pretty much not a, isn't a beer I don't like, but <laughs> we have a great one up here, local. There's a great a lot of local micro breweries around now these days. Guinness, Guinness, yeah. I mean, Irish pub last night. Um, the bass player had some Guinness. The one in front of me, <laughs> nice. Yeah, I've been thinking about, you know, maybe I should get a beer for the stream or whatever, but uh, um, we have this great one, great, it's called the Whalers. I don't know if they have that anywhere else. IPA, yeah, I like I like the IPA. I That's the Whalers, it's kind of, they have an IPA, um, I can't, I don't know if I can pronounce that. I don't want to pronounce it wrong. Hefwasen? <laughs> oh, I'm sure I'm pronouncing that wrong. They don't have anything in Seattle, really? Just coffee, huh? I have tried that, that uh, Hefwasen. That's, that's, a, that's a good beer, too. I like that. Um, is that the one that's the... I'm trying to remember which one that is. But I know I've tried it. Yeah, Whalers, they have um, Whalers Proclamation, all these different microbreweries just in, in Rhode Island. And they're they're all pretty good. Oh, you got, oh, nice. Nice. Yeah, we got all different kinds of things up here. Um, so let's, what else is going on? We got the new video. I know it's taken a little bit of time, but uh, the um, Rockabilly Boogie, Rockbilly Boogie is coming out soon. I got all the stuff recorded for it. I just finishing up the edit and then that'll be, That'll be up hopefully this week, possibly, hopefully by Monday, maybe it might be a little bit later, depending on, you know, if I run into any technical difficulties or issues, I'm going through it and I go, oh, I got that wrong and I got to go back and reshoot it. But, but I try to do my post-production and make sure I have all my ducks in a row before I even get to the editing process. That way I don't have to rearrange everything and go back but um and doing these scripts the next thing i want to get is to help me out a little bit is i try the best i can but memorizing the scripts to look sort of if i'm looking in the camera and talking to memorize what i have to say even though i wrote it i don't remember what i wrote <laughs> until i uh actually get down to, to recording it and Having a nice little, they make these little teleprompters that you can sit. They just reflect from the iPad or the iPhone or whatever, whatever phone you have. And it just reflects on a mirror and you can see it. And it, the lens goes through the camera like a, like a teleprompter. And then you can kind of 
um, read what you're still look at the camera and still read it. And then it saves a lot of time. That way I'm not retaking, retaking, retaking. And then you have to go through and edit all that stuff down to, to get it, uh, to get it right. But, um, I try to avoid it as much as possible. Um, but the little editing tricks that you, that you learn, the jump cuts, that's kind of a, become apparently it's like a YouTube thing where it's part of the style of it, which is really just an excuse to like, Oh, I screwed up and, I need to make a cut there. Um, and you jump in. If you notice, sometimes the camera will like zoom in and then zoom back out. So it makes it look like it's part of the same scene. Sometimes it is. Sometimes it's an aesthetic choice just to put a kind of punctuation on what you're saying. But most of the time when you see that with people, it's because there was a, there was a cut, but, uh, but that's fine. It's YouTube, you know, <laughs> not Hollywood. <laughs> A lot of the hops are grown in Washington State. Nice. Yeah, we've actually played a lot of breweries. Um, there's one... Where did we play? I think it was Proclamation. Almost played the Whalers Brewery. We didn't get a chance to do that. Then we um, potentially have a, have a show at the Narragansett Brewery um, in Providence, which is... Uh, that would be in May, maybe. I'm not sure yet. Haven't got confirmation on that, but that would be cool. That's uh, Everybody knows that from Jaws, right? That's a good idea. Yeah, I don't know. I, I took acting. I, did, I, I used to do stage acting back when I was like a teenager and I don't remember. I, I think I did the same thing. It's been a long time since I've done it, but I would just do that, read a little bit, go as far as I could go back, read, you know, back and forth and back and forth and then just do it over and over and over and over again until you finally, you finally get it. Um, and that's the, and if you're going to do, you know, if you're doing something like stage acting, you have, you have to, you, you, Get it all in one one shot. You got to memorize all this dialogue. I don't know if I could do it today. I don't know if I could I could do a long a stage uh, show anymore. I don't know if my my, my memory is there anymore. I can remember songs. Um, we played rock Billy. We played a rockabilly boogie for the first time actually as a band last night at the show, and I just threw it threw it under the bus just to see what how it would go and it went, it went pretty well, I think. And I remember the solos for, for the most part, at least, at least, uh, um, <laughs> at least 70% of it. Nice. What's the name of it? Do you know what the name of the, the name of the beer is? Oh. <laughs> Songs and scripts. I mean, lyrics, I guess. If I'm just learning a like a solo, like a like an instrumental, I have there's a visual cues that are going on where I can remember the um, fail breaker. Oh, cool! Yeah, I've never haven't heard of that one. Um, yeah, there's visual cues, you know, I think I, I always call it fretboard memory, um, where you know that, oh, I'm, I'm in this key, so you know you're going to roughly be in certain places, and so it can only be so many combinations, so it narrows it down a little bit, and so if you're playing an instrumental, whatever the song may be, you know, it's a pattern, you're remembering a pattern as opposed to remembering words. And I guess when you're memorizing dialogue, if you it have a certain inflection, you can have that 
cadence that you can remember. So I, I'm better at remembering melodies. I can remember a cadence and a pattern and stuff like that. But when it comes to just individual words, static words together in order, I can do it. It just takes a little bit longer for me. I don't know why, but um, so one, yeah, one of the like learning sleepwalk or something. Um, you don't get the rockabilly sound. Well, depending on where you're palm muting, um, you gotta have, you have the delay, I, I would assume, because that's definitely part of it. Um, but the main thing is the, 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 the pick, the way you're hitting the, Depends on the guitar a little bit, but for the most part, when you're palm muting, you don't want to go too far. See how it kind of. You still want the nose to ring out a little bit, obviously. And then it's the down, up, down, up effect that you're getting. So whether it's straight or swing, so if it's if it's um straight. You're always accenting the one, the downbeats, you know. And and then when you're swinging, you definitely have to go um, down, up, down, up, like. So I've seen some people try to like. That can get tiring just trying to go all down strokes all the time. So you always want to go back up, down, down, up, down, up, especially when you're doing the swing thing. And you're almost letting the pick glide a little bit when you're coming back down and... Kind of like that. And then you just slowly speed that up. I mean that's the way I've I've seen it, and then if you're playing individual notes, um, same thing when you're playing uh, yeah, well individual notes. So you're doing something like like this. Everybody knows. Swing the eighth notes, and the same with the uh, when you're playing chords, it's that same kind of thing. And the delay, having the delay on whether you have a couple of, couple of delays that are longer or you have quick ones. I think I have the setting. I can't really I'm gonna turn the guitar up, but let me see. Yeah, it's got a, this is just a digital delay, but um, you can hear that, that quick little kind of fast decay. I like that personally because that way I can play a bunch of different genres and different tempos and I don't have to worry about the delay getting in the way if it's too if it's a, a if it's like one or two where you can get like a bop 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 you know like let me see if i can change the setting here thank you for uh um saying for the like and subscribe i appreciate that Oh yeah, the mute pads. That's right. I have forgotten about those. I have never owned a country gentleman. Uh, let's see if I get the. Oh yeah. So some, sometimes you get. That's the quick. Go a little longer. That's too long. So some people will do something like that, like it's like one or two, and 
it's cool when you're playing something slower, but if you start playing something really fast, it can get messy. And that can, especially if you're doing something like a two beat, you know, and you want to, you're playing, you're doing something like that. If you're doing something that fast, you probably don't even want delay at all. You want to just switch it off. When I do um, Cannonball Rag, I, I turn the delay off. It's just dry. It's just there's too many notes going on at once. You don't, you don't need it. Um, but if it's uh, a lot of the time, I'll even do that on acoustic because it just it doesn't need any effect at all. But with a, but yeah, that's that's basically kind of how I I achieve the rockabilly sound. You don't really reverb too. If delay and reverb can work really nice together, um, I sometimes use the spring verb. But um, and that's cool for the surf rock stuff. But generally, depending on the room that you're in, at least for us, a lot of the place we places we play and clubs will be op pretty open, and it's just natural. There's so much natural reverb in there that any effect you add to the PA, the vocal, the or the guitar itself is just you, there's already plenty of reverb in there in the room. And if you add too much, it just gets lost. It becomes very washy, and so keeping it. A little bit less that's just something to be aware of and it's it's hard to tell when you're playing in the band and being you know looking out versus what you hear you know what the audience is hearing unless you have a sound guy but that's rare <laughs> hello welcome from cambridge cambridge england Oh, thank you, man. I appreciate it. I'm glad you enjoy it. Glad you enjoy the channel. And yeah, try to keep doing this as it continues to go. You know, we'll try to do the live stream a little bit more often. And eventually, I think I've mentioned it, I want to do a podcast um, also on the channel. Like, try to do it once a week, but who knows. Um, with other local musicians that I have played with over the years and... There's a lot of good bands and a lot of people that play roots music in the New England area that um, would be nice to talk to and hear about, you know, the history of um, of the music in the area. There's a, uh, I don't know if anybody's heard of them, there's a, a band called Roomful of Blues. They're f probably one of the more popular bands, I guess, around the area. Um, individual musicians, uh... Uh, Neil, Neil and the Vipers used to be called Young Neil and the Vipers. Um, and uh, what's the other one? Um, well, Duke Robillard, he's pretty, I think he's pretty well known. He's got his own Hot Licks video from, <laughs> from the 90s, even. But um, I don't know if I'd be able to interview somebody like that, but maybe eventually. And, you know, the channel can help help everybody else as well and help the community of roots music because i just that's one of the goals at least for me is to help keep it alive in um in a broader sense online and also um you know locally as well duke yep he was just we he's at um there's this local bar in uh providence called nickanies and we play there every couple weeks every like six weeks or so and he was just there, like, last week, I think? Or something, something like that? Or he's there periodically. I've seen Purple, who I've never heard of before. Interviewing big, big names. Wow, nice. Yeah, you never, I never, you know, never know. I'm waiting for the channel to kind of get to the next stage of monetization because I'd like to be able to at least be able to give the people something to come if they're, you know, donating their time to, to chat and um, hang out and add to the channel. So that's slowly, slowly going. And what's the next? I got a... Um, 
like I said, the memberships now. So there's the, the little super chat things I guess you can do. And the I've seen it on other channels and I've seen the the um, the little emojis I made. They You could have just the standard one. So I made a whole bunch of different ones. I made all, all, all little guitars and stuff. I think, oh, why, why not? You know, <laughs> it'll be fun. <laughs> and um, are those the, no, those are the badges, not the emojis. The emojis are, are like, um, I forget what I did. There was only, four, I made four of them, like a mic and a jukebox and a wrecker, a 45 and a something else. How can you get faster? Um, well, there's the fastest, let's see. There's two, there's a couple different kinds of picking techniques. There's alternate picking. Um, and that is basically go down, up, down, up, down, up. So no matter what string you're, you're playing. And typically that's a great way to play as well if, if you're reading um, notation and stuff too. Because you know that pretty much every downbeat is going to be a downstroke and every upbeat is going to be an upstroke. So that helps kind of keep that in check. However, if you're, when you're building up speed, there's economy picking, which is every time you're going down to the next string, you go down. And then when you go back up this way, you go up regardless of what stroke you've you've hit what regardless of which direction you picked previously so you're always going down as opposed to right yeah so, oh. you're always going down so that's economy picking and the best thing to do is it, it, I've looked up what other people have to say about it as well yeah, practice, practice makes perfect. <laughs> How do you get to Carnegie Hall? <laughs> um, the, uh, but those those picking techniques will help. Um, they say using a thicker pick helps, but I've never really found that to be to be true. Uh, I use a standard Fender medium pick. That's what these are custom picks, but it, that's what they are. They're just standard. Um, I just got I just got them because it has the little Teledyne's logo on it, and it's cheaper to do this than to buy picks at Guitar Center. So, <laughs> so I figured, why not? And I bought these probably. Oh, geez, at least two or three years ago, and I still have a bag full, and I think it was. 70 bucks for two big bags of picks. So it's totally worth it. Um, but yeah, the, the, you know, practicing. And then when you learn a riff, um, if you're playing something note for note, you want to just learn the direction and how you're, how you're picking. So if you, if you find a picking technique that, works for you so mix and match economy picking alternate picking and whatever is smoother for you just stick with that and keep practicing that over and over again and you'll eventually build up the speed but typically typically the econ the economy picking that that's the best way to um to kind of get a little faster it's just just that split second of instead of having to go back and you're going down you keep going down makes all the difference in the world and it if you're not used to it, it can take a minute to really to to get fluid with it. But once you do, it's worth it's worth it. It's worth the ex the the effort. And then of course, as you're playing and learning new riffs, the way I always approach soloing is I have a bag of tricks that of that I know I'm familiar with. These are riffs that I can pull out whenever in any key, and I know where they're they're gonna work. And then I mix that with stuff I'm making up on the spot. And that's, that's kind of how I, so it's like, so it's 50, 50, a lot of the times and just practice. And like, like, uh, like you just said, start off slowly and speed up with time, practice, 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 practicing to backing tracks 
is probably the most beneficial way as well. Um, if you can, if you have the ability to make your own backing track, if you just take a MIDI bass line and a drum and a drum beat, and you can just adjust the tempo. Um, <coughs> excuse me. Um, and just slowly pick it up, speed it up, and you're practicing to that. Um, you can it you can play to a progression and you can play to the actual beat as well. And then if you don't want to get locked into a silent kind of progression, you can just just mute the bass and just play to the beat. Uh, that's that's what I've I've done. Yeah, that's what Danny Gatton did. I'm sure Setzer did the same thing. I'm sure that everybody's done the same thing. So. Thank you. Thank thank you. I appreciate that. Yeah, that's what I the backing tracks. I used to have a little Tascam 4 recorder on a on a on a cassette tape that I would just record. It was an old I had a Roland Boss um I still have it, a Roland Boss drum machine. And I always used to think it sounded fantastic and now I hear like hear it back now and I go, "Oh my god." <laughs> it sounds so so cheesy, but it worked for that purpose. I could record. Um, there were some things that worked it worked fine on, and yeah, exactly. If you have the backing tracks, you don't need the metronome because um, that replaces that. Um, I found it difficult with a metronome personally because you can't really feel the pulse of of the music to really get familiar with it, and it doesn't translate to a live situation because when you're playing with a real drummer tempos are going like this no matter how good they are unless they're playing with an Ableton you know you're in that situation which is a whole nother nightmare a whole nother level um the uh typically drum nobody plays to a click track live uh they might have a beat a thing called a beat bug which is a little that goes on to the um, snare, and it's a reverse metronome, so it click it counts the, um, it counts the the back beats, and that will kind of, it's kind of a speedometer for the drummer. It tells them how fast they're going, and so they know if they're going too fast, they can kind of slow down or speed up. But um, yeah, the uh, the tempo is really the responsibility of the bass player, not so much the drummer. The drummer's um, more about the feel and it's it's kind of it's a little bit of both but for the most part the the if the bass player starts to speed up and starts to play ahead the drummer is going to follow that more than likely um sometimes it can if if the drummer isn't quite familiar with what they you know how to pull it back they can it can go they're supposed to work in tandem with each other they're supposed to lock in so the bass is locking in with the kick and the and they're they're playing off of each other. And that just takes time and experience playing with different uh different players and playing to records, playing to clicks. Um Oh, they all played all, all the modern artists they're all playing to it's a program called Ableton. It's usually controlled by the drummer. But there could be somebody else off stage also controlling it, depending on the budget, I guess, for the 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 uh, the production. Um, I know this only because I know a drummer uh, who is around. I played with him around town. He used to play. He was the he was the drummer for the Dixie Chicks back in the '90s, and he he told me about you know like this is what they they do and they have and the Nashville guys they all they all play to this program and it's basically a, a um a click a big click track just a um you know where it but it has all the cues in there and all the parts i think it can get really complicated if you want it and it tells everybody's got the in-ear monitors so the whole band is listening to this thing it's not just the drummer so every time that the cue is coming up, I don't I've never used it, so I don't know how how it works exactly, but I believe there are some cues that happen 
where it'll say like, okay, your part's coming up and it's, you're getting ready to go and, you know, do whatever you got to do, whether you got to, part of it has to do with those massive stages, even with monitors and everything, it's really hard to hear what's going on. And when you're so far away, it may seem like the band is really close together, but when you're up there, there, you feel like compared to playing in a small club where you're turning, you're right next to each other in this big stage, it's like way over there. You can't really, you can barely see what they're doing and almost not even hear what they're doing. And with the monitors and delay and stuff on stage, it can be, it can be weird. And so I've played on some big stages before and if the sound isn't perfect, you just have to go by memory. Like you can hear what you're doing, but you may not be able to hear what the other guys, you can feel the pulse of it and you just have to play from, from memory as best you can. And uh, hopefully it all works out. It usually does, but yeah, all the, all the modern artists are using some, some form of, of click track and it's some, they can have samples going on. They're basically also playing to a backing track. So if something goes wrong, the backing track can come in and kind of take over and, and, uh, there's a singing backing track for some of the stuff. If something happens to their mic and it continue, they can continue going. Do I use what I, uh, I'm not sure what that is. Imes or I, or is that a, is that a initials? I E M S. Yeah. I find with the, with the metronome thing, I find at least just a standard. I always had the, you know, the old, Click, click, knock, knock, you know, piano metronome where you have the weight on it. And it's fine if you're playing something struck uh, straight, straight rock, straight, um, straight eighths. Uh, and for classical piano and stuff, for the most, it's all straight. It's not going to, nothing's going to swing. And so for that, you can kind of do that when you're playing piano or playing just individual phrases and stuff like that. But when you're swinging, it can it can be tough to to kind of to get used to that. It's better. It's and like I said, it translates way better when you're trying to go play live. You'll you'll feel much more comfortable uh, if you're used to the backing track. It'll almost feel like and and if you even take like the song itself, if you can get the whole backing track for the song you're trying to learn, the actual structure, play to that, and then when you go play live, it's even it's even better. That's what I do for for um, my band is I'll make for original songs I'll make a make a backing track and record a demo of the songs I'll use a, the drum machine that I use for the, the videos and then I'll record the bass and the guitar and then sing on it and everything else and then everybody can listen to that and learn it and play to it and then when we go to rehearse we just have to play it a couple times and it's like oh yeah we're good and now we just tighten it up and we play live so it saves a whole lot of time you don't have to spend hours and hours going over songs in a rehearsal um, in ear monitors? No, I don't. I've tried. It, they're very distracting for me. I I prefer um, having a monitor down in front or none at all. Um, most of the places we play, a lot, not not all of them, but some places we play, I don't need the monitor necessarily. The speakers that we use are these JBL six o six o five, I think. Anyway, they're kind of not om completely omnidirectional, but they they're designed so you can kind of just turn it a little bit and it doesn't feed back in your mic, but you, you can still hear out of the side or side fills are great. I love side fills. So you could actually hear the music. Uh, it's like a monitor, but on the side of you instead of in front of you. Um, a guitar. I'll sometimes use the guitar. I'll th put that through the monitor, but generally not. Um, Depending on the room, if it's a really washy room, uh, I like to mic the guitar so I can keep the volume of the amp down and push it through the PA, and so I can hear it, so I can control it a little better. Uh, and and then you can control the overall volume of it because it's easy for an uh, a, an amp to get to get out of control, especially for um, especially if you have a combo amp. That's why I like using these the basements or anything that has a head 
separate from the cab. I think I mentioned that last stream where you can you can wire a, an amp to separate the, the head from the from the cab, but it um, and then you can use an attenuator and keep it keep it down. Otherwise, you end up with you can't get it quite loud enough to really get that saturation and touch sensitivity and distortion that you want. And so you got to turn it down and then you lose it. And if you turn it up to get it, it's too loud and it's just very frustrating. But, um, but with these, don't have to worry about it. <laughs> yeah, sorry, I just saw that. Yeah, met, yeah, it's like running on a treadmill. Yeah, we try to change our set as much as we can. Um, we always add in new cover songs, just songs we know, and just to keep it interesting. And we have a backlog of of tunes. We know like well over a hundred songs as a band. It's just we haven't, we, and so we don't. You only have so much time in a show, so we'll flip it around all the time. And we have what we call the alt list, and. If we need to fill in some space, people aren't there yet, or people are just shuffling in, we'll we'll uh we'll play some um some standard rockabilly stuff and until we go to the actual set. But a new stuff at the moment, we are we're working on a whole new uh, original album. We had our our other one; it's been a while, and since we released that one, that was twenty eighteen. So, uh, wanted to get it out a lot sooner, but you know, life gets in the way and. But we've got about half of the tunes recorded, and about the other the other half is almost written. I think there's a couple of tunes we're still working out the kinks on, as far as um, the the structure, and then schedule some studio time and mix it all. So what I think what we're gonna do this time is we usually wait it until we get all the songs done, and then release an album if that's what you even want to call it now, since it's all on Spotify. Um, I'd hate instead of waiting all that time. I think I'm gonna release the songs individually as singles on YouTube, and that way, and then that way you could hear the you know people can start listening to the songs as we start as we continue to release more. And then once it's all done, then we can put it into a a full album and then put that on Spotify. The me Sandman. <laughs> Are you talking about the one I did? <laughs> I think I know that guy. Which one? The the lesson one or the one where I recorded just the song? Or is that or are you talking about somebody else? I don't know. Yeah, at first when I started doing the channel, I just started doing just recording songs just to kind of work out the technical difficulties of figure out how to how the editing works, how the syncing works and all of that stuff. So, yeah, I think I played the bass in that. <laughs> yeah, I fired him. I fired him. Oh. Um Yeah, actually, that bass, I well, it's the same bass. That that's the bass right there, um, and that uh, when I recorded that, I still had the old crappy strings on there. I had these things called what are they called? I shouldn't say crap. I shouldn't say that, but they're they are they're good for what what they do. Um, the company, for for my purposes, I didn't I didn't care for them. They were called um, soup. Not Super Nils. Those are those are different brand. I think it's called oh, Superior Bass Works. So they're not bad strings if you play Psychobilly and you just slap, and that's all you play. But if you want to do any kind of jazz or anything else, they don't. You you can't really get notes out of it. But then and and the nice thing about the Superior Bass Works strings, they do make a synthetic gut one that's not bad. But again, unless you're just playing, you're slapping. 
if you're not, if you want to ever switch it up, you can't, you can't really uh, do it. And you don't really get the notes that ring out very well. But they're easier on your fingers and they're cheap. It's like 30 bucks for, for a set. So I can't really, can't really complain. Uh, do we, do we play any big venues? Um, I mean, what's the biggest venue that we've played here? I'm trying to think. Other than Ocean Mist, I'm trying to think of a, um, if there's any, there really isn't anything major other than, you know, like, uh, arenas and like a, the Duncan Center, which is kind of like our local arena. Um, the Met, the Met is probably a bigger venue. Um, that's probably the largest venue that I can think in Providence, other than it used to be a place called um, Lupo's, which the Met became, Lupo's became the Met, and they moved. Um, then there's, uh, oh, the Narrows. That's in Mass, but basically Rhode Island. It's in Fall River. Uh, we played there. That's kind of a bigger, a bigger venue. They used to have a lot of good venues in um, Newport, but they, they shut them all down and built condos and hotels. So <laughs> there used to be a, um, the yachting center would have uh, you know, like Los Lobos, Chris Isaac and stuff like that. And that's gone. Um, we would play like Fort Adams. That's uh, which is, which is more of a, a, just a mobile stage. So it's a big, like, you know, event concert stage like the Newport Folk Festival and stuff like that. I haven't played that, but um Jane Pickens Theater down in Newport, that's they're starting to have that's mo you basically a movie theater is more of what it is, but they've started to have live entertainment there. Actually Big Bad Voodoo Daddy's going to be there in May. So and we play there a couple times a year. We have this fun event that we do annually in July for um, the summer uh, Jaws party where they show Jaws and they have like Narragansett beers and popcorn and people come in and watch the uh, will watch the band for the hour and you kind of have a, yeah, a captive audience and then we uh, have to we have set up our full PA and our whole band and then we got to get off get everything off the stage so they can lower the screen down in like 10 minutes so but um, it's fun it's it's a fun fun show yeah big bad voodoo daddy I opened for them years ago uh, at twin river twin river casino I guess that's another venue I, I guess they're around I just I don't think about it, but we were playing some bigger venues and then, you know, 2020 happened and, and, uh, we were going to play Viva Las Vegas out in Vegas for the rockabilly festival thing that they have out there. And that got canceled and we just haven't really kind of gotten to the point, you know, it's expensive to travel because the, you know, be great to play these things, but you have to pay your way to go play. So it's not, it's, it doesn't really make sense. So started doing the YouTube thing. <laughs> I figured I'd be a lot easier than, um, and I can reach more people long term than just playing a festival, a one off. But I still would like to go to Vegas just to see it at least. Yeah, I would think so. I would hope so. I would definitely, I'd still do it, you know, if, um, if they'd have us there, there was a, for a while, they haven't done it. Uh, the Viva Las Vegas, they were doing a East coast version for a little while. Um, it's called Viva East. And we did that. We did it every year until recently. And I, they might start it up again. I'm not really sure. It's hard to get those things going. I mean, you know, keep the, you know, financially to maintain it all the time. Even if they sell out every year, it's still, it's still tough. Yeah, I'd love to go to the UK. Now, maybe. A lot of it's um, based on, you know, promoter interest in 
to where it's worth it. Maybe if the maybe maybe if the channel gets big enough and we can get the get the music out there, we can eventually do some kind of a some kind of a tour. That would be that would be fantastic. Does the Rev player? Yeah, the Rev the Reverend plays here all the time. He was here. Um, he's here. He's gonna either he just played or is going to be in Boston, right outside of Boston soon. And he's played in another place called Alchemy, which is downtown Providence, a couple times. Um, one time, it was a couple years ago, we actually were playing the bar at Nick and E's, and we, the two places kind of worked together to kind of, okay, pre-game, everybody go over to Nick and E's first before Alchemy opens. And we'll play. We played a set. And then after that, then we go over and we see it was a big Sandy opened for the Rev. And then we see the Reverend. And yeah, that was a lot of fun. And big Sandy, he came over and uh, said hey to us. And we had a, that, that was a cool, cool show. And then there was a random surprise like week. Oh, the Rev's going to be in town uh, to, this Tuesday. Want to go? Sure. You know, <laughs> But um, the psychobilly freak out, yeah. Uh, he did all the hits. It was great. I always get if I if I have a chance to go, I'll um I'll always go. There's another. There's a the casinos, of course, in Connecticut, um, Foxwoods and Mohegan Sun, which uh, the the Wolf Den in Mohegan, the Rev the Rev has played there, and and there, that was that was a great show. It's free too. It's great. Sandy and the Flyright Boys. Yep. It wasn't the full band. It was just him. Um, well, he played with a band. He played with a, I think it was the Rev's backup band that played with him. Um, I can't remember. It's been a while. I can't remember exactly how that went down. I don't, the Rev didn't play with him because I know it was another guy playing uh, guitar, I think. And it was, but he was, playing and he had a there was a drummer in a bay. I think Jimbo played bass, I think. If I'm not mistaken. Oh no, no, no. I know who it was. It was a local guy. Um it was a buddy of buddy of ours um from a local band up here uh, called the Soapbox Saints. And he used to be in a band called uh um the Royal Crowns. Not Royal Crown Review, the Royal Crowns. And that um Yeah, his name's Jack. And he uh he played bass. I forget who played drums, but yeah, that was that was cool. Thank you. I appreciate that. Thank you. That's uh that means a lot. I try. I try the best I can, you know. <laughs> South by Southwest. Wow. Yeah, I've never that would be a fun show. Definitely. Hmm. What else has been going on? That's kind of been, you know... This week, I've just been thinking about the video, the next video, that, and Honey Don't is going to be the one after um, Rockabilly Boogie, and somebody asked for an, oh yeah, the, the Two Hip and Double Talking Baby. Wow. Yeah, back in the, back in the heyday of the, the Rockabilly Swing Revival. Yeah, I never got a chance to see a lot of those bands. I've I've seen I saw a few back then, like Big Bad Voodoo Daddy. Um, right when I was getting into the genre and playing rockabilly and brutes stuff in general, um, a lot of the bands were either 
not touring anymore. Well, also, also I lived in Florida and at the time, and I'd noticed like nobody was coming to 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 Florida after like two thousand. I forget what it was like. Everyone and I realized like, oh well, Florida's kind of off the beaten path because you would. If you if you're touring around the country, you just get to go in a circle, basically. Maybe go up to New England a little bit, but to go down to Florida, that's that's a six hour drive or more, and then you got to go back. So you kind of have to plan it, and that was the way it was explained to me. So that's what things people like sets or orchestra, for example, it's just not didn't really make sense. Oh wow! I turn up. Why? I don't know if I I. I'm, I I say I'm not familiar with uh, Joe Eli and Rosie Flores. And it could be I know them, I know who they are, and I don't, like I said, I'm really bad with names. But, um... Yeah, it was... I saw a couple. I did finally see... Never saw... I know up here, the Squirrel Nut Zippers are from up here. I never did see them. They did play a show, I want to say, kind of a semi-reunion show recently or something, but I never did see that. I didn't, I don't, I missed it somehow. Um, and Cherry Pop and Daddies I saw in New York. Of course, they were technically a ska band, I guess. Oh, okay. Wanda Jackson. Wanda Jackson, I actually, um, did I open for her? I didn't. No, I didn't. Did I? Yes, I did. I did open for Wanda Jackson. I couldn't remember if I was just there for the show, and it's like, no, I must have played, because I would have never. I would, I, um, it was a long way away. It was several hours to go, and I know that she was going to be in another venue that was closer, but then I got the opportunity to go and open, so I did that instead. And then the band that I played for... The, the guys that were playing with me, they uh, had another band. I think it was just the bass player that was playing with me. Um, he, um, his other band, or they had knew all the Wanda Jackson tunes, so they actually backed her up after we opened. I can't remember the name of the venue. It was in Tampa, but I can't remember the name of it. Um, Link Ray, too. We opened for Link Ray. Um, One of his last shows. That was like... I forget what year that was. 06 or 07, something like that. I know that name. Yeah. Did it any rumble? <laughs> he opened with it. <laughs> yeah, we opened with it right away. That was a Yeah, that was a fun night. Oh, sweet. The set? What do you mean, like... The songs that we do, or are you talking about the... The, the rig? 
or settings. This is always a fun one. I could do this song. How about that? How about the, uh, could do a lesson on that one. It'll be easy because it's just the same thing around and around. Um, well, my, the rig I play with live is, um, 63 Fender Bassman or 64. This, I can't remember. This one's a 63. It's what I usually play with. And then I'll play with a Mystery Brain delay pedal and the Gretchen. That's it. And, okay, I'll use a spring, the... The Dan Electro, oh, Dan Electro Spring King for the reverb and uh, just a, one of those boss, what are they? Uh, and a TR2, should be easy enough to remember. <laughs> um, the tremolo pedal. Which I found out is the same Brian some someone, right? Yeah. <laughs> Which is the same tremolo pedal that I guess he uses too. I saw uh, there was a, a video earlier this year or last year or whatever where they uh, they did a rig rundown on his latest tour. And I was like, oh, this is exactly what the same stuff I have. <laughs> Which, of course, I've been slowly building the pieces. But um, the uh, the mystery brain is just reliable. So I used to use... First thing I used was an Ibanez sound tank delay, which, well, I started out with one of those Boss digital delay pedals, and I just didn't really care for it. It just sounded too dry to me. And then I got the sound. Somebody else said, oh, try this, the sound tank. And and that was great until I got the uh, Dan Electro Real Echo. And that was cool because it had a stereo out, and it had a, a tape warble effect, and slider on it to to get your uh the different sounds and i would run it usually like one signal the delay signal and a dry signal is how it would come out so one would go in the normal and the other one would go in the bass rig and that was cool but i um i switched to the the roland space echo uh pedal the re20 the digital one and that that was cool but it just didn't it didn't have the preamp circuit because it's that the pedal unfortunately the newer the doesn't matter which Roland Space Echo version they're the same they, they redesigned it a little bit here for this last year a couple years ago but it's uh it's based on the 201 not the 301 so it doesn't have that preamp circuit which is what the mystery brain is based off if it's based off the 301 that has the they call it the brown chip and it's um uh, they use that he uses that same chip in the mystery brain, the nocturne guys, and that creates that preamp distortion, or it's not really distortion, it's just it just pushes the signal a little bit more and it kind of just tightens everything up and compresses it. And you you hear the difference. You wouldn't think it would be much, but it's a huge difference. And that made the sound. All of a sudden, I didn't have to crank my input and crank the amp as much. It was, it was great. And then I finally got one of the actual Roland Space Echoes, the 301, the tape delay, just sitting back there. And they're watching the rig, uh, the sets are breakdown. It's like, yeah, those things are temper temperamental. Yeah, they're not kidding. They definitely are. The, the hardest thing is the little arm inside that, that kick, keeps the tape tight. If it's too tight, it warbles and it goes out of tune and it's horrible. And if it's too loose, the tape will flop away from the head and you lose it. So once that's set properly, it's great. I mean, it's amazing sound. It's at least live any, anyway. I, you, I do have a second basement. One's a 63, one's a 64. So I'd, I'd run those in stereo and that is an amazing sound. That is incredible. Um, I'm going to try to do that again this week if I have some time to tinker with this and get it get it working properly. But that's my 
basic setup as far as guitar, which guitar I use most. Um, I try to give them, I try to spread the love as much as I can between them all. But, uh, um, probably this one, probably, uh, lately. Um, I used to play the orange one all the time. I just like the shorter, uh, scale, the 6120 scale versus the, the Falcon scale. Although I played the Falcon last night for the first set and then I played this one for the second set and I like them. I like them equally both. This one's a little bit louder than the, than the Falcon. Uh, what's the Falcon? The Phoenix, the Black Phoenix. But it's, uh, I'll sometimes bring the, the jazz box if I feel like it. But for the most part, this one, I, I know that, you know, I don't know if you can see it, but it doesn't take very long. I bought this, when did I get this one? 2018, I think? Something like that. 19 or 18. It doesn't take very long, and you can probably can't see that, but you can't see it. But the the divots in the frets will will uh, happen pretty quickly, and then you got to do a. Luckily, I know how to do it, but um, you got to do what's called a grind and polish or a G and P. I've heard some people call it a fret dress, but I was always told it was a grind of polish, at least when I started working in that field. Um, <laughs> forget the liking. Build strong bodies, well driven away. Nice. <laughs> uh, it's probably not your playing. It's, I mean... The 201 is great. It just it just doesn't have that that preamp circuit. But again, the original the original 201 was designed more for uh, I want to say it was vocals and synthesizers and stuff like that. Um, but we think of them now as more of guitar effects. But uh, yeah, the 30 they also made a what is it 501 and the 5552. Five, I think, or something later doesn't look as cool, but it's uh, but apparently that has the same circuit as the 301. And for so, for sound wise, and I guess they're a little bit more reliable than the 301, but um, and they're cheaper, they're quite a bit cheaper than the than the 301s. I'm surprised that they that that roll it considering. How much, um, you know, notoriety or popular they are that Roland just doesn't remake them. There is a company in um, Australia called Echofix um, that does, makes their own tape echo. I haven't tried it, but I, I would assume they know what they're, maybe, you know, might be good. I'm not sure. But, you can get parts for all of these space echoes for the 201, 301, or whatever. And that's where I, I have to, I got actually have to order the part for the arm to get the replacement because you're supposed to replace that every 300 hours or every time you replace the tape, you replace the arm. And it's just a piece of metal with a little felt pad on it. But um, it's, uh, you, you do need it. And you can see if it's the one that's in there, I, it's, probably the original so you can tell it's got a lot of grime like black grime from the tapes that have been used <laughs> that it's just like sliding you know got to get rid of that but uh, but you can get the that's where you can get the tapes now and they're fairly easy to put in um i did i replaced i was a little nervous at first i had to get the gloves and the 90 percent alcohol and rub it and get uh, like just shaking but finally <laughs> it was fine it was fine um, but yeah, I got two tapes and one table lasts me several years. I don't use the thing that much unless I know I am safe and I know that people aren't going to come up and start knocking into me or something at a gig. I can bring, I'll bring the space echo, but some, a lot of places we play are so, so tight. I can't even put my pedal board on the ground. I have to put the pedal board up in the back behind the amplifier. And then if I want the delay off, I have to go hit it with my hand.
the lack of USA. I'm sorry, you asked a question about um, the lack of controls. Oh, on this thing, yeah. Uh, no, it doesn't really bother me. I mean, the the knobs here, they don't. All they do is, all they do is just control the volume anyway. So I always just this and this, and it's really all I need. Oh no, I still want the Falcon or the Phoenix. I still want the Phoenix. I use it. I use it enough. But yeah, I I mean, even with a telly, I mean, I don't really. That's just a tone knob. I do kind of. It would be nice to have a tone knob, but um, I don't even know if I'm sure there's some Gretches out there that have them. But um, I don't know if I'd really. I don't know how much I'd actually use it to be honest. Yeah, I'm hardly a rock star, but <laughs> um, the uh. I could imagine the actual rock stars, like, uh, I mean, you know, Brian's got multiple delays, and as there's a picture of him somewhere with, like, the Roland Space Echoes just stacked on each other, and yeah, they have to bring him because if it's, they don't really have time to go imagine and go through and get the tape tight and everything else, so they just have to be working, and... So there's a little screw in there that you can kind of tighten the, the, the arm, and if you don't get it right, it's too much, and back it off, and this and that, and and you have to run it at least. They say run it for at least I want to say ten minutes or so before you start using it, so it warms up the tape and get the loop it goes through the loop several times, and it's it's a pain, but what a sound. What, the volume knob? Or the tones? Oh. No, they don't. I mean, they don't even have tones, tone pots. Like, Setzer's guitars don't have any tones, tone pots. And the Revs, I don't think his model has it either. Unless he's got the three, he might have one tone knob with the two volume um you can kind of get a weird sound if you turn you do like middle position get both pickups going and you can turn one pickup down you can get a unique sound out of it if you want more of a jazzy jazzy type sound you can kind of get a little more of an attack and kind of turn it down a little bit but I, the the hot rod doesn't have any of that and even this orange one i've um i had it all I might have it rewired now that I, that was before I had this one. I had it rewired, so it, I got rid of the mud switch, and it's just basically a hot rod now. It's just the, the pickup selector and the volume knob. But, because I never used the other controls, and I would, if I hit the mud switch, then it would, it would, what, what's going on? And then, you know, oh, jeez, click it back, so, uh, but I gotta have that thing looked at anyway. It started crackling. Well, last one of the streams I was doing, it started crackling, and it started crackling on me the other day. And I'm like, I don't know what, what's going on. I need to have somebody else take a look at it and just see what's going on. I don't, I don't feel like, I don't really have the the tools and everything anymore to go through and take out all the pickups and rewire it and everything. So, but it probably needs to be rewired. Yeah, you know, yeah. So he's saying like don't don't touch the don't leave the volume all the way up. Oh, okay. Well. Okay. Yeah, I mean sometimes I'll if I'm I don't do it very often, and that's partially because I've noticed when I use the attenuator, I have to, I can play, I can keep it open the whole, all the time. And just, if I want to get quieter, I can just kind of play lighter and dig in a little bit more. But if I'm ever able to take the attenuator off occasionally, 
um, it can come in handy. I can just I just turn the volume down a little bit, and then I can do that, you know, play something like that. Um, and then turn it back up when you want to go into a lead. Or you're doing the volume swell thing, you know. You know. Don't touch the pickup and tone pots. <laughs> yeah, metal's a different, different animal. You have to have, um, recording too I mean you compress the compress everything so you can get that get that sound yeah I'm not, I don't really I've never touched him although I know Danny Gatton would have that tone pot I want to say he had him flipped around because he would do that you know almost wah pedal type sound but with the with the you know <laughs> The the uh the tone pot there. My favorite rockabilly track? Oh jeez. I don't know. That's that's a I've gone in, you know, spurts. Metal. Yeah, I'm not I mean, yeah, I'm not really. It's it's okay. I'm not something I'm not gonna go out of my way to, to listen to it, that's for sure. But I have seen, I have been to some, some concerts. Um, the favorite rockabilly track? I don't know. I mean, I'd have to think about that to absolutely pick a favorite. So I'll go and I'll, one's my favorite, like right now. Um, probably right now it's rockabilly boogie, probably because I'm working on it, but, um, Collins kids, yeah, I used to do um, uh, the uh, their version. Well, I didn't do their version of it, but like just because the guitar work on stuff on that. Uh, did King of the Five Strings? I heard of? I've I've heard the name. I just I don't. I'm not familiar with the any tunes. Let me see. There we go. Didn't come up. Oh, there we go. Writing it down. Let's see if I can. I'm always looking for new stuff to listen to, so. Oh, there we go. Save some stuff. Let's see. <sighs> Good. I think it's something I haven't played in a while. Um, Cat go, little baby doll. Yeah, that's right, the double neck, yeah. 
Dad Drag. Yeah, that's what came up. Actually, actually I looked for it on um, Spotify here. Just That's the first one. I saved that to my, uh, to my list. I will take a listen to it for sure. Or uh, Please Mama Please. Solo thing. That's a fun one. We do that one. Um, I'm sure I will. Yeah, I wish you could play songs like... Uh, I guess some people do on stream, but you can get copyright strike for that <laughs> if you're not careful. This other one we do, I've been working on it for a while, is, um... An instrumental, um, it's an old song from, like, uh, an instrumental called Tico Tico that, um, we started playing as a band. And I based it off of an original organ solo from the 40s uh, by this organ player called Ethel Smith, and she did all these crazy, just super fast like organ runs and everything else. But it's originally a guitar song, a uh, Brazilian guitar song, and it's a cool, it's a cool thing to play as a as a rockabilly thing. <laughs> More of like a Latin, Latin feel. So that's fun. Yeah. That's what I was talking about, economy picking. Just getting used to the runs and what the which run you like better, which way you pick. Uh, stick with it, whatever it is. It doesn't matter whether it's the economy picking or the uh, 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 alternate picking. Be used to how you play the the phrase. And you stick with that, and you practice it, practice and practice it. And I've tried to go back and forth sometimes. Well, maybe I'll try it this way and try it that way. You'll confuse yourself, and you'll actually, be, it'll become more cumbersome than just sticking with what it, what's working for you. And everybody's di everybody's different. So, all right. Yeah, I don't really have anything planned today except to get back to editing the next video. So I'm just kind of hanging out here. I'm glad you guys are hanging out with me. And Next time we'll have to grab some beers. and <laughs> We'll have a beer with you guys on stream. Yeah, because next week we got another show next Friday. And then I don't have anything on Saturday. Yes, I think I do. Yeah. Nope. I have nothing going on next Saturday except for this, other than probably editing some more uh, for the next next uh, the next video. And like and sub, absolutely. Like, subscribe, share the video. Hit the notification bell. All the all the things. You can become a member now. Um, so I know right now the uh, the only thing that's there is I had it on the Patreon too, and was um, 
for the higher tier subscribers or for Patreon. And I did the same thing with the YouTube because it just allowed me to start doing that this week. Is uh, if you want, I do um, a one on one guitar lesson, private stream, or via, you know, you can sign in to, you know, join the chat and join the channel either via FaceTime, Zoom, or whatever, you know, you want to do if uh, somebody was interested in that. And uh, a couple, you know, had a couple. Um, that did it through, uh, through Patreon, but, uh, is, uh, just, uh, oh, I appreciate it, man. No, no, no pressure for anybody. I just, I just something to, to do it. I, the biggest thing was becoming the, the YouTube partner, um, getting that approved, uh, because that was the, the biggest hurdle. I, at least from what I was, I've been reading and been, been told, like, once you get approved for that, then, it's easier to get the next, the next tier, which is when they start advertising for the, or not advertising, when the, once you start getting paid for the ads, so, that, that come up. So, once, now that that's there, it's just nice, it's nice to, to have it there. And I've noticed, at least, I don't know if, I'm, this is my imagination, or, or what, but it seems like the subscriber count has gone up a little bit faster since, since this channel's got partially monetized. Maybe it's because it's pushed more in the algorithm. I hope that that's the case. Uh, it could just be that doing the live streams and gets the, the other videos out in there. Cause the more you, the one nice thing about YouTube that I've, I've liked is, um, the more you put into it, the more you get out of it. So you get out what you put in and that's, that's nice. Um, it can be discouraging sometimes, but, uh, it's, uh, it's still a lot of fun. I enjoy the process. I enjoy the work. I enjoy the enjoy the editing. I am still working on that behind the scenes, uh, not behind the scenes, but uh, may, uh, the history of the, the some gears and things like that, uh, like the basement and some delays and delay pedals and things like that. Um, yeah, just keep it going. Hopefully. Uh, I'll keep building the community and I'll have some guests on soon with the podcasts and also, and maybe make a, and some whole videos with the band. And I do have this, um, if you guys would be interested in seeing it, it's like a sort of a behind the scenes of what it's like, kind of a, for lack of a better term, a day in the life of, uh, of what it's like of playing in a, playing live shows. Thank you. I appreciate. I appreciate it, man. Um, just kind of, you know, B roll of us where what it's like to behind what it looks backstage and for some of the places and some festivals and things like that and some funny little clips and and um, almost like a in the vein of a for lack of a better term a a, a reality show kind of edit definitely a better bass player definitely a better bass player <laughs> all right well um yeah we've been going for i think this one's new record hour and a half here and um i think uh for today that ought to do it for today um i um i am yeah, trying to think if there's anything else that's going on right now just want to get those new videos out i've got a couple um i've actually got three going right now and one, of course, is Rock Billy Boogie, and then, of course, and then Honey Don't, and then another um, gear review that I that I have that I'm going to be releasing, hopefully this week, if not early the following week. And we will uh, reconvene next. Oh, we will reconvene next week. Um. 
at the same time. Oh, thank you. I appreciate that. Well, yeah, the more you can tell people, I really appreciate it. And um, we'll, uh, we'll definitely, we'll see you guys next week. And uh, yeah, thank you guys again for hanging out. And enjoy, I definitely enjoyed doing this. And we'll have more, try to come up with some more, more things. So maybe next time go over, just let's, you know, I'll pick a song or something and we can just kind of, same bat time, same bat channel. I was going to say it and I, and I, I, I was, re I was <laughs> restraining myself. <laughs> Um, but yeah, um, I'll just pick a song or something and we'll go over it and kind of break it down live on, on stream. All right. Thank you guys again. Take care and we will see you guys next week. And I'm sure you guys will see when the new videos, as soon as they drop, I'll put a post up too. So, um, at least a day or so before. So you'll know know that as well. And we'll see you guys next time. Have a good one, everybody.